Hi all you Mojotonians, welcome back. Here we are. We're in the final phase of wiring our amp. Um, uh, the next phase will be adding the uh, 1.5K resistors as well as the 100 ohm resistors for the pilot light for the filament. Um, but I, I want to explain that a little bit. So filament lines are the heater supply, the 6.3 volts at about 2 or 3 amps depending on the transformer or even more. Um, for the tubes to operate properly. The, the cathodes in all these tubes that Fender used, um, and Marshalls as well, they had to have that supply to heat up the cathode in order for the tube to work properly. I'm not going to go into the physics of that, but um, what's more important is that you know what the heater supply does and where it goes. Okay, so your octal, your 6V6 tubes, as well as your 12AY7 and 12AX7 um, operate at 6.3 volts in in this actual amp. 12 volts actually operates the preamp tubes, hence the name 12AY7, 12A, uh, excuse me, yeah, 12AY7, 12AX7. Uh, you know, the nomenclature of the number 12 means that it has to use the last 12 amps, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, why that is? Why we're using 6.3 with the 12 volt supply or 12 volt tubes? Um, so what they did was on the wiring diagram, and Fender did this as well. They would come off of the actual pilot light, and I'll show you the wiring diagram here. Come off the actual pilot light with these two 100 ohm resistors right to ground. And what that did was that created a fake center tap, a noise shunt, I guess you could call it, for the 60 cycle hum. Or actually, it would be, yeah, I guess it'd be 60 cycle hum coming off the 6.3 bolt you know filament to the actual tubes themselves what's important about this is that if you look at this wiring diagram closely and I'm not sure if you're gonna pick up on this with this light because it's kind of wonky but um, the two green that come off the transformer of course are the same color there is no difference whatsoever it doesn't matter which one goes where um, just as long as they aren't touching and they're, they're not short shorting each other now what does matter if you notice coming off of the actual pilot lamp here you've got two different color greens there is a light green and a dark green. Um, and the reason we did that is because when you come down to the first 6V6 that you're going to be supplying, you know, your supply bus that goes all the way down, um, these two tubes are going to operate in parallel uh, for the filament heaters. And we have the lighter color going to pin 7 and pin 7 here, and the darker color going to pin 2 and pin 2 here. So on a almost all of Fender amps, um, 6V6s, uh, 6L6 amps, they always 2 and 7 were the filaments for their amps and for the models they had themselves. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm tripping over my words here. Um, but when you get down here to the, the actual preamp tubes, we do have the light going to pin 9s here and the darks going to pins 4 and 5 here. But it doesn't matter. Um, the way that these tubes are wired up as far as you know the filament goes they're kind of well they are they're in a humbucking fashion okay and it doesn't matter these don't need to run in parallel with each other well they do run a parallel but you, it doesn't it's not as critical down here if you have um, say pin 7 going from here to pins 3 and 4 here versus 7 here or 9 here and the same here doesn't matter um, down here it does so that's why we have two different color and it's, it's I really need to look at the wiring diagram on this to figure this out okay so on the original ones the reason we had this green was because they use a green twisted 18 gauge solid uh, for uh, actually almost every single one of their amps up until uh, 1976 or 7 um, they changed over different colors and they use PVC wire but in this case, what I want to do, and this is that 18 gauge green wire that we had that I showed you that we use for grounds. Um, this is very robust wire. Um, it's pretty tough to manipulate, or excuse me, it's, it's, it's easy to manipulate, easy to bend, but um, when you get down to the preamp sockets here, because the, you know, you're running out of real estate when you get down here, uh, the slots are minimal in the tube amp socket, and that's pretty much almost any tube amp socket, you know, especially uh, some of the import and some of the belt and stuff. It's very difficult. Now, you can do it, but it's very difficult to run 18 gauge into these, the filaments, um, the filament pins for the preamps. Of course, the, the octals is not a problem because you have, of course, two holes for every connection on here, as you see in your kit. Um, but what I like to use. Um, 
And it, I, let me go back. The reason that we actually have this in the kit was because that's exactly what Fender used to use. Um, customers are weird in that some, well, I shouldn't say that. Some customers are strange, especially OEM builders. They like to keep everything 100% authentic, and they want to use this. So that's what we include in the kits is this stuff right here. And if you can use this stuff, more power to you. Uh, it'll handle much more current, and it has that, that visual vibe to it that's 100% authentic. Okay? Um, what I like to do to make my life a little bit easier uh, and as far as servicing and knowing what this humbucking fashion wiring is, is that I will use a 22 gauge uh, black and white pre tin cloth cover that we sell in our store. Of course, again, this is a matter of personal preference. I, uh, you, you know, it electronically the benefits are nothing. Um, they both do the same thing, and this can handle uh, more than enough current for this amp. So I dropped it down to 22 uh, twisted pre tin cloth covered wire that I'm going to be using here. Um, and when I was talking about the humbucking fashion coming off the pilot light to the first tube, um, when you get down here it actually makes life a whole lot easier because you can just glance at it and know that okay the white's going to two so the white needs to go here. The white you know needs to go to two here and just for you know keeping everything uh, consistent we'll do the same thing down here. It's a whole lot easier. Um, but what I'm going to do now, I'm going to stop the video, I'm going to put the two 100 ohm resistors in to ground here, uh, like what's in our manual, and I will be right back. Okay, so we're back. I've got our 100 ohm resistors in place here, as well as because I use the same uh, hole in the pilot light, which is the, the top hole, you can do bottom or top, doesn't matter. Um, I went ahead and put the the filament line to the action to the first octal already on there so I went ahead and soldered that so I you know making sure that as I go along that things are done you know behind me um, now one thing I want to point out is that I'm not sure why this is but a lot of people um, when they're assembling these kits I'm not sure if they get in a rush or whatever um, the 100 ohm resistors that we have right here are sometimes swapped for the 100k that are in our preamp right here, um, or one will be there, and uh, I'm not sure. I mean, they they're brown, black, brown for the hundred ohm, and brown, black, yellow for you know. You can just glance at this and see it's got the yellow stripes on it. I'm not sure if you can see that, but um, so I know those are hundred Ks in the right spot. So that's the trouble area. Um, the reason I think that happens is that as you get when you try to do this build, and a lot of people do try to do this in one sitting. Um, Unless you're well versed on what's going on in the amping, actually, you know, you can do this with your eyes closed. Um, if if you haven't done this before, when you get to this point, your eyes are starting to do some really weird things for you. Um, you're not paying attention to detail. You're just trying to match up a drawing to what is going on here, and I think that that that's what the problem is. So it's very important as you're doing this, um, like what Mojo has done with the four. Uh, basic assemblies you know as you move along it's very important that you rest your eyeballs in your brain because after wiring this thing up and the amount of detail attention to detail that's required even though this is a very simple amp um, a whole bunch of things need to go right in this amp and for it not to work it only needs to have one thing wrong so keep that in mind um, and I think NASA actually used that same uh, anyway um, so what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm going to run this down to our first octal here um, and always give yourself, I said this at the beginning of the video, give yourself a little bit of service length um, because uh, speaking from experience um, if you move forward and build more of these amps and then you start servicing a lot of these amps for customers and um, you know just for yourself and want to modify uh, unless this is absolutely vintage and you have to keep the actual tube sockets in place, if you need to rebuild, if a socket gets wrecked or something, you're going to have to rebuild the socket anyway. Uh, you know, put a new one in. Do not unsolder, just snip it off because you'll save yourself a whole lot of aggravation down the road. And that's why I like to have a service length on these wires. So I know that down the road, if I wreck a tube socket, I've got plenty there that I can trim off right at the tube socket and start over fresh with wiring that goes to the actual socket itself. Um, now again, the, exempt, the exemption of that are the, the vintage, uh, you know, I think 
they were Bakelite, um, vintage fender, and some of the Marshall stuff sockets you don't want to replace. Um, you can replace the pins in those. Um, if you search the internet and you, you've wrecked a socket in a, say, a, a 69 Plexi or a 1959 100 watt Marshall, chances are you can find another used socket or something that's current production that's very similar. So you buy the socket and actually pull the pin. Don't replace the socket, replace the pin. And all of these pins in Mojo Amps are fully replaceable. Uh, I have to do that a lot in classes because uh, for a lot of people that haven't soldered, what happens is that they'll have heavy hands, they'll leave the, the soldering iron on the actual pins themselves, especially for the preamps, um, not so much for the octals, but they'll leave the soldering iron on there and feed literally a whole inch of solder into the, you know, trying to make sure if something doesn't look right, they reheat. Um, and, and add more solder and if it still does the solder they keep doing the same thing and what happens is that you wind up with these pins full of solder so you get the entire amp done you're wiring everything's good everything looks good in here but you know what tubes not gonna go in do not reheat the socket don't do it do not reheat the socket I'm gonna say that ten times do not reheat the socket why because it will melt um, don't want to do that. This is these are ABS sockets, which is kind of an industry standard now. Um, there are some companies that, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. But it, it's as easy to replace as I'm going. I'm going to do it actually on this filament um, pin right here. If you can see pin nine, which is right next to that nut, right here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, um, if you break a pin off or you have too much solder in it, you can't get the tube in. Cut the wire. Don't unsolder it. Cut it. Cut that wire off right there. Uh, bend this just slightly forward so the tang is there. And then you can push this pin out. If I can get my needle nose on there. Well, I can't do that. Ah, let's see here. Ah. Of course, these are hanging on way too well. Or, in, in a situation like this, and I'm not doing this because I can't push it out, but what you do is you actually, after you cut the wire off, you take this pin, you can see this, um, it does have a fatigue rate, so you can bend it back and forth, and what that does, it breaks it off at the base, there we go, and the pin will drop out the bottom, there we go. And I will replace that pin, of course, as we go along. But these pins are replaceable. Um, you know, don't, don't, especially some techs, you know, they've not got to replace the whole socket. No, you don't. You only need to replace the one pin. So, you know, it's only a $5 job, but if you replace the socket, it's a $50 or $60 job or, you know, whatever they want to charge you. So, um, and these are common. Belton's, uh, these sockets, uh, we're actually moving to Belton. These are Belton style. Very good, very good quality sockets. Um, anyway back to the filament um, I'm going to start here and after I get um, the second octal done I'll uh, I'll come back and show you what I've got so far okay okay so we're back I have our filament run from our pilot light to the first 6v6 and then bust over in parallel to the second 6v6 and I have my leads already attached here on the pins themselves that are ready to go right to the preamp sockets down here. Sockets down here. And again, like I said before, um, I like to run these up and over in this particular instance. Um, and I also added the 1.5K resistors back here. If you can see them, um, they will stand up, sorry, they will stand up in the actual chassis um, like the originals did. Uh, I'm not sure why they did that and didn't put them on the board, but that's okay. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I do know they, they eliminate a lot of lead, lead length for these. Um, so, but that's you know that's a good good example of uh, fender efficiency for you. Okay, so I'm going to run these uh, down to the actual preamp tubes, and I will be right back. Hang in there. Okay. One thing I want to hit upon real quick, remember when I took the, the number nine or pin number nine out of this preamp socket right here? Okay, I've already gotten one out of a uh, existing socket I had on hand just to spare four cases like this. Um, if you notice, when you look at this pin, there's a tang sticking up right there. Uh, 
we can see that. It's right there. A little tank sticking out. Now, if you get a tube socket, any tube socket, and this happens with a good majority of almost all tube sockets, um, a pin will fall out over a period of time. Um, there, excuse me, not over a period of time, but from time to time a pin will fall out, even when it's new. All you need to do if the pin falls out is to use a pair of good flush, uh, flush cutters, I like to use these pliers, and you can go in and actually pry that tang up a little bit so it grabs the actual socket itself. Now, when you look, there's only one way to put these in, and when you look at the socket, it's going to be really hard to show you on this. If you look at the socket, you'll see on pin, I'm going to use a piece of wire here, pin 9, which is way down here, if you notice that, it's got a slot, and the slot is oriented to the outside diameter of the actual socket itself. So when we go to put this in here, um, the solder tab on the actual pin itself will go towards the outside. So um, what we do is we, and it'll only go in one way. So I'm going to drop this in and you'll know you have a good firm fit when you push it in slightly and you hear a, oh, I'm not sure if you heard that, but it clicks into place. And there you go. Instant pin removal or replacement or removal and replacement. All right, there we go. So that's our good pin in place. That quick. Took, what, 30 seconds? All right. I'll be right back and get the rest of this stuff wired up for you. Hang in there. Okay, so we're back once more. Here we have our filament wiring done for our octals and our preamp tubes. Um, again, like I said, <clears throat> the uh, octals need to be in run in parallel. Sorry, there's a blob there. I need to get rid of that. But black uh, pin 2 here black pin 2 here and just to keep things consistent not necessary but I did uh, black for pins 4 and 5 here that are jumped if you can see that and it's on the wiring diagram pins 4 and 5 are jumped together on almost every single uh, 12 series actually they are on every single 12 series preamp tube that Fender used um, and Marshall for that that matter um, actually I think all amps to use a 12 uh, anyway I won't go into that but this is what your 5A3 should look like. Um, of course, please be forgiving on the, the wiring job. Um, have to do this looking through a camera is kind of hot sometimes, but um, the general concept is there. It's it's all 99.99% sure. The last thing we need to do is the power cord here. All right. So we have three wires here. We have black. We have white. And we have green. Of course, black is your line voltage, 120 volts from the wall. Um, white is neutral, and green is your chassis ground. Okay, the original ones did not have that. They had a white and black, or I've even seen some cords that were just two black. So it was a guessing game to what was what. Um, so this, um, I stripped this back about four inches. Six, between four and six inches is fine. Um, this is a 10 foot cord, actually. Uh, if you have a what's called an IEC cord, the one that, that goes on the marshals and com uh, yeah computers and amplifiers and stuff, it's got a plug on there. Um, in a actually, you, you can just cut that thing off if you if you need an, an extra cord, a longer one. Um, but this is a, a ten foot cord that we're using here. Okay, and we're gonna insert this in, and I don't have a pliers in front of me. But this will come through here, and you want to leave yourself enough length to where the green can reach the ground, either on this side or that side. Um, the white can, you know, reach the switch, and the black can reach the fuse. And again, you want service length, so you want a little bit left over, okay? And let me go grab my pliers, and I will show you how to put the strain relief in down here in the hole for it, okay? It's kind of tricky. I'll be right back. Okay, we're back. This is the strain relief for an 18 gauge cord that we sell. Um, almost all vintage fenders use this. Uh, black face tweeds, uh, brown face, you know, everything. Um, and these can be kind of tricky to put in if you don't know really what's going on. So what I want to do is I want to look at my wiring here and I want to make sure that I have enough length for 
uh, everything that's going on. So, like I said uh, before, green to ground, which can go on either side. I probably have it actually coming over here since um, I don't want to resolder any of this. Um, black diffuse and white uh, to your switch. Okay, so I know that's good. Now, this has a flange on the outside. If you can see that, there's a ridge. And the flange actually goes on the exterior of the, the chassis itself. Um, and this part that actually does the strain relief for it, um, you'll notice it's kind of like a guillotine in there. It, it kind of uh, it clamps down on the, the sheathing of the cord as, as well as the wires and, and prevents you from you know pulling anything out, which is kind of cool. Okay, so when I put this in, uh, it's a two-handed effort here, unless you have special pliers for it. Um, but I'm going to show you how to do this with, with wire strippers. I'm going to give a little bit more length there. Okay, so I'm, I'm holding it with my fingers like this. And of course, you'll notice as you go to put this in, it'll only go in one way. Um, I'm going to use my wire strippers and switch hands here. Let me get the uh, other leaf in. There we go. All right, so right below that flange, I'm going to use the wire strippers to clamp this down and with any type of luck here this is pretty difficult I mean if you've never done this before it can be kind of tricky uh, you need to do a lot of things at, at the same time so I'm move my, my, my pliers here real quick there we go alright so I'm gonna swing that extra well, I can't grab it right. There we go. I'm going to swing the little extra piece of plastic that holds the uh, grabber on there into the chassis itself. I'm going to squeeze with the wire crumpers. And I'm going to pull in the back here. So once I have it started from the back, I can let go of the wire crumpers and actually push my thumb and pull it. And it snaps into place just like that. That's that easy. Um, but it's kind of uh, it's kind of daunting if you've never done that before because you got a lot of things going on one time you need to look at. So that's our that's our strain relief. Simple, very effective. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to wire our main 120 volt line in, and I'm going to try to do this you know as clean as possible. So I'm going to add a twist to the, the neutral and line wires. Um, I'm going to run my ground course down here that will be cut off to our other ground tab on the output or excuse me the power transformer and that is our chassis ground and I will cut these to length the white I don't need to cut but the black let's see here the black I'll cut right about here okay so I'll get this wired in and I'll be right back hang in there okay all right so we're back for the last time I've got our power cord wired in here, as you can see. Um, again, uh, as I explained in a previous video, I'll, I like to leave the uh, uh, stand or the excuse me, the ground switch on the <coughs> the tweeds that have this for current builds. I like to leave that unconnected. Um, and you'll notice our ground down here, our main ground, is to itself. I want to make sure that's really firm. Um, and at any time, if you think your solder your soldering is you know, subpar or, or doesn't look right, um, you can always do the, the pull test for everything. I do this in the class sometimes and I actually hang off some of these parts and it freaks people out thinking I'm going to break it, but these circuits are very robust. Very, very robust. Um, so that is it. This completes the wiring for the entire amp and our next videos are going to be actually firing this baby up and hope I don't blow myself up. <laughs> nah, just kidding. I'll be firing it up and we'll run through some test voltages um, in the proper sequence. Very, very simple. Um, so please, stay tuned, alright? You gotta stay safe and corona-free. Alright? Take it easy.